So welcome everybody. We have uh, some folks here in the room and then uh, uh, lots of folks on, on live stream. Uh, this is a continuation of a program we did a week and a half ago on self-care um, and mindfulness, in particular the role of compassion and um, um, self-care and mindfulness. And so this is needed now. So uh, my name is Bill Duane, and I look after the well-being and sustainable performance programs here at Google. And during uh, my team's team meeting, we took time to do a check-in on how was our own well-being. And for many of us, most of us actually, it was pretty bad. It was sort of remarkably bad. Um, lots of emotional distress. And just to put a name to it, uh, the particular cause for the distress was, uh, you know, two further incidents of black men being killed by police uh, and the issues of systemic racism uh, in our justice system that that represents. Um, and then, of course, there have been the sort of like litany of other stuff going on. Um, it just seems like every time you watch the news, the rate of these things is rapidly increasing. So uh, not all of us, but a, a number of us felt sort of um, distinctly not OK. Um, and on top of that, with, given that we're the well-being team, uh, when we unpacked it, we realized that we felt bad about feeling bad. Right? We're just like, oh, I don't want to feel like this. We shouldn't feel like this. And of course, then it's possible to feel bad about that, and it's feeling bad all the way down. Right? So, um, so one is I just wanted to start off by way of introduction to just acknowledging that you know, if that's where you're at, you're not alone. It seems like that there's something really um, different, and, and, and this is an odd way to use the word, but special about this time that makes it something different. And that specialness has a lot of potential. Right to think differently about the way things are. But in the short term, there's also the, the very practical need to uh, tend to our internal experience so that we can show up in the world the way, the way we want to. So this talk is going to focus on the expertise of our presenters, which is to say mindfulness, and in particular, mindfulness um, and compassion. Uh, but I also want to note that mindfulness is not the only way to deal with these. You know, in particular, connecting with friends and family is a great way of, of self-care. Exercise, sleep. Sleep is amazingly supportive for this. Um, so there's probably a number of other things that are supportive for you, and I encourage you to really pay attention to those and make time for those. Um, but for, for this session, we're really going to be focusing on, on, on mindfulness as a means towards self-care. and. One thing I want to point out is that we're talking about self-care not as a way of numbing or escaping, although it's really reasonable. Like, when you feel bad, you're just like, well, I would like to feel better, please, as soon as possible. Um, and some of the strategies for doing that are sort of suppressing and, and turning away. Uh, the real thing that's amazing, what we're talking about here, is this idea of actually turning towards the difficulty and turning towards your internal um, experience. Now that's sort of radically counterintuitive, right? So how do you do that? How do you do that when you feel bad? And the answer is uh, compassion. Compassion allows you to hold difficult experiences uh, in a way that can keep you focused on it but also focused on other people. And uh, normally when we experience strong emotion, we're a puppet to that emotion. It's sort of stimulus response. By cultivating the skills of self-awareness, self-management, and compassion, when you experience these internal feelings of discomfort, uh, you can actually put a, a, a little bit of a pause in there between stimulus and response. There's the great Viktor Frankl quote of in between stimulus and response, there's the capacity for a pause. And in that pause uh, lies the chance for our freedom. So that's what we're talking about today. Uh, and, and once you're free of that sort of automaticity of behavior, then something beautiful happens. And the beautiful thing that happens is the opportunity to act in the world in a way that's in alignment with your values. Right? And this is the way that we can both tend to our internal experience while also making the positive change in the world that we want to. It's this idea of an engagement with ourselves and with our communities and with the systems that were a part of it. Um, while also tending to our own self-care. 
So that's obviously a pretty tall order, so I'm about to hand it off to two friends of mine so they can do the, the actual work of this. Um, <laughs> it's sort of radically counterintuitive. So I have two dear friends. Um, uh, one is uh, Sharon Salzberg, uh, who is really one of the meditation OGs. She is one of the first people to bring Vipassana practice uh, in the current wave um, to the United States and really do a bunch of uh, a quite beautiful translation of this. Um, she is the one of the founders of the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts, which is one of the preeminent Vipassana centers and schools uh, in the West. She is also the New York Times best-selling author of books like Real Happiness, Real Happiness at Work, Real Happiness at the Dry Cleaner, Real Happiness While Taking Out the Garbage. No. Uh, getting back to real books now is uh, Loving Kindness and a book on loving your enemies. Um, and one of the things that I really enjoy about Sharon uh, as a student and also as a friend is deep wisdom and knowledge from some of the source wisdom traditions that these practices come from. She really knows her stuff. Um, but it also seems very real to me. Like, Sharon is also a New Yorker who has seen some shit, right? And there's an earthiness and a saltiness to the way that she teaches that I find, like, really necessary. Because, like, my, my compassion, my relationship with compassion has to exist in the real world. And that real world is, is far from perfect, as you started off with. Um, also joining us is my other friend Phoenix Soleil, who is uh, a longtime uh, meditation practitioner. She is also an expert in something called nonviolent communication, um, which is a, a class that's available from time to time here in uh, here in Mountain View. And um, uh, let me know if you would like the contact information. She also offers coaching and um, uh, uh, and meditation mentorship. Uh, she is also a teacher in training at Spirit Rock, which is one of the other preeminent uh, 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 Vipassana uh, centers in the United States. And she is also a New Yorker who has seen some shit. So <laughs> <laughs> I should also point out that I'm from Queens, so, <laughs> so we seem to have a... Uh, 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 we seem to have quite the group of New Yorkers representing in this area. Um, so please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Phoenix and Sharon, who will be leading us in um, some practices and some little bit of lecture and also some exercises. So thank you. This is, was put together at extremely short notice again, Phoenix. <laughs> so thank you very much and welcome. Um, so happy to see all of you. And uh, I was really grateful to be here a couple, a few days ago uh, at the New York office. And it's interesting, uh, I was telling a lot of people that I noticed that after doing that um, hour, I noticed that I wasn't as, um, I didn't feel as helpless when I would read the news because I had done something that was in connection to my values. And uh, I just want to compliment all of you for coming together um, here today and people who are joining us, because you're taking time in your day to put some attention um, on, on some really difficult subjects. Like I think one of the ways that we um, are habitualized to, to deal with things is push them away. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that because sometimes you have things you, you need to do. You, people have families, you have jobs, and sometimes you just can't handle the, the feelings inside. And it might be really intelligent and smart to take some time and say, I'm not going to deal with this and I'm going to do whatever is, you know, uh, really urgent in my life. What we know is that over time, there's a consequence to that. It costs. There's the stress involved. There's the, um, you know, because it's still there, even if we're not looking at it. And that space that we're putting it to gets full. If we keep putting things in it, it keeps getting full. And then, you know, something small happens with something, uh, someone we love, and we might um, lose our temper. Or we cut someone off in the highway, and, you know, it just builds up. And then it becomes like a volcano. And we know, we see on the news, some of the effects of people having volcanoes inside. So right here, you're doing the difficult human job of coming and facing the pain. The other way, the other thing though, on the other hand, the other way that we can um, handle 
um, with something difficult, is to fall apart. And I think that's what pauses. A lot of us choose the other one. I'd rather push it away than fall apart. I, I'm afraid of being so overwhelmed that I'm not function. That I won't function. And as a New Yorker, it's been bred into me that I have to function. <laughs> you know, I've seen all the Rocky movies, and I know that I'm supposed to just like put, <laughs> get up there, put it all to the side, and win the gold or whatever championship it is. <laughs> Um, so those are the two pieces, but then um, that falling apart, does that help anyone? You know, like it's so beautiful that as a human, we are um, affected by things, but is, is that going to, um, uh, it's beautiful that sensitivity. And we see what happens when people aren't connected to, our, to this sensitivity. So what is the answer here? And this is one of the practices that creates this other space that's in the middle, which is equanimity. This creates this space where you can process the pain and you can be with it in this loving way and you, what you get to be is able to see the big picture. You're not consumed by it, and that's, this is how I sometimes feel, <laughs> and you're not pushing it away. And that is what we're creating. And it takes time. <coughs> this is, I mean, we have a culture where it's like, you want to take a quick pill, and the quick pills don't end up um, creating a, 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 more, a more safety in this society um, for us internally and for other people around us. Uh, so I'm just going to check in. If there was anything I wanted to start with. <coughs> The other important piece is that sometimes taking that time to do that self-care can feel so selfish, you know? Um, like, we want to do things, but this is the preparatory work, because when you're having a conversation from that pain, are you really open to hearing someone? Can you really bring compassion to them when you don't have compassion inside? When there's all this, like, oh my god, I can't stand this, a lot of times we don't have the resource that we, we need to be able to sit and think, really look at the big picture. Because I think the problems we have, there aren't quick fixes. These are slow, these are these slow solutions. They need the long range. And um, I want to start with a sit. I want us to be, come into this room and come into our bodies. And um, it's interesting that uh, we talk about running away because in a, uh, what I think focusing on the breath is a way of is a healthy way of running away in a way because you're connecting to your body and you're connecting to um, um, the, the experience of being uh, a human that right now right now in this moment and Whatever thoughts you have about things, you can put them on the side for a little bit, okay? So I'm going to ask you to uh, close your eyes. If you don't feel comfortable closing your eyes, you can put your attention on the floor or something neutral like the wall. And um, if you find that what's inside is being, you can keep your eyes open. That's one of the suggestions. And we're gonna, there's many kinds of breaths that you can use. I like this, um, you take a, we're gonna take a long breath in, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, purse our lips and let the air out through our lips. If people can see, and you're pushing it as long as you can, um, as, as long as you can. Just a long ex ex exhale, and you just let, uh, let the tension go out with your breath. OK, so let's take a deep breath in. And pause. And let the breath out through your pursed lips. Take another deep breath in. And you can do this on your own pace. Don't feel like you have to wait. And take a pause. And let go.
And then I'm going to ask you to do three more on your own pace. Appreciate you doing all that with me. And I'm going to count from five to one, and at one, please open your eyes and bring your attention back to the front of the room. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. I noticed that people's expressions seem more relaxed. Yeah. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Sharon. It was at Google that I first heard the term OG. I don't know what it means. Do you all know what it means? Oh, see, not everyone knows what it means. It means original gangster. <laughs> this is the first time anyone ever called me that, and I prize it. It's like everywhere I go, I say, you know the best introduction I ever had? <laughs> it was at Google. It was Bill Twain. He called me an OG. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I did go to India quite a number of years ago in 1970. Uh, came back in 1974 as a meditation teacher, a mindfulness teacher. And uh, it's kind of extraordinary, of course, to see the wave and to see the new prominence of the word. And one of the concerns I have about the word mindfulness and the implications it might have for people is a kind of passivity, you know, or complacency, like in a kind of immediate way, uh, I was leading a meditation once, and we began with listening to sound before moving to the breath. And I'd gotten no further than listen to the sound, and someone raised their hand and said, well, what if it's the sound of the smoke alarm going off? Should I sit here mindfully knowing the smoke alarm is going off, or should I get up? And I said, I'd get up. <laughs> you know, but the ways mindfulness is defined correctly, you know, often brings a kind of confusion just because of the associations we have with the word. You know, mindfulness means accepting things the way that they are. Mindfulness, mindfulness means being with things without judgment. Kind of sounds like you're going to sit there with the smoke alarm going off. So metaphorically, I think that's a good picture of our time. There are lots of alarms going off. And Sometimes we can think, oh, something like mindfulness is going to give me the ability. It's like Bill said, to sort of numb out. I'm going to just accept things the way that they are. I'm going to just be with things without judgment. And uh, it's not quite like sitting there with the smoke alarm going off being passive at all. Um, really, we're talking about many levels. Um, we're talking about having a dynamic relationship with our experience instead of perhaps being so caught in habit. We're talking about, um, just as Phoenix was saying, finding a place in the middle where uh, we're not necessarily consumed by what's going on because that really debilitates us or devastates us and doesn't necessarily give us any room to act. Um, nor are we going to hate it and fear it as a kind of cultivation. Like, you know, I've been meditating for 45 years. I shouldn't feel this kind of thing anymore. Damn it. You know, it's just not useful either extreme. And so there's a kind of creativity in that energy. 
Um, and I, I feel it is very aligned with the power of love or the power of compassion. Uh, I think one of the things I've done in meditation practice, or we do in any kind of introspection, uh, when we're really looking, doesn't have to be meditation, is I felt like I really looked at all the things, or not, probably not all, <laughs> but many of the things that I'd been told were true. Where does strength lie? How alone am I? Um, what are the divisions between us? What's the reality? Is a quality like love or compassion really as foolish and gooey and sentimental and weak as I've been taught? Is vengefulness and hatred as strong as I need in this time? You know, so I feel one of the greatest gifts I've gotten from my own practice is that ability to look with a kind of rigor and honesty, and, uh, and it needs a lot of compassion, because it's not always easy what, what we see in, in terms of our conditioning. I feel like um, there's a, a core within all of that of recognizing our wish to be happy, to feel a sense of belonging, in this body, in this mind, with one another, a sense of home somewhere. And even more than that, almost like the right to that, no matter who we are, no matter what others tell us about us, whatever stories are told about us, that that is really at the core of our being. And so uh, I think mindfulness is very connected to that as well as we practice. Um, and again, it, you know, we can practice mindfulness a million different ways. It doesn't have to be through meditation, but it's that quality of looking and, and looking with a, a kind of sense of your own, I'd say, innate dignity that we, we do deserve a kind of happiness. And so um, I've practiced with... Um, Striking fast food workers, for example, striking for $15 an hour minimum wage, and who are risking everything, like everything in their lives to sort of take a stand and say, I have some worth, you know, as a, a person. Um, I've sat with people who have been subjected to incredible violence, you know, or their families, and um, and have watched in awe as people have tried to work through what their where their ultimate happiness might lie, and um, how they might reweave the story of what's possible for a human being based on the things that they've gone through and their, their wish to make this a better world, you know, and not just kind of cycle down and endlessly spiral down. Um, there are a lot of admirable people in this world, I find. You know, we don't often hear about them, perhaps, uh, which is a problem. Uh, but for me, the core of my being able to venture forth into some of... Um, these terrains is having had some shit happen in my own life. Uh, it has have been has been really the offering of some tools, you know, so that these aren't just idealistic notions, and it certainly isn't leading to a kind of passivity or or complacency, but um, really some tools to help me see through. Um, kind of the myths I've been given, work out of them, find sources of strength that I never imagined were strong at all, uh, which is why you know I teach quite a lot of loving kindness meditation, which maybe we'll do toward the end of our time here together. Um, and it's, of all techniques, it's one where uh, 
people often approach it in the beginning as like, that's stupid. You know, how can that make a difference? Or, um, but like all things, it's an experiment. You know, it takes a little risk taking to see for yourself if this is something that might, might be onward leading. Uh, it does begin, I think, with a kind of self-knowledge that is um, very personal. It's very insightful. And this is really one of the greatest powers of, of mindfulness. Uh, these days, when we talk about mindfulness, mostly we talk about things like really enjoying your cup of tea because you're actually tasting it. You're not so crazily multitasking while you drink the cup of tea. And that's really good, but classically, the main goal of mindfulness is to reveal our lives to ourselves, to understand so much more about what's motivating us and what's onward leading and what's really bringing us down or even crushing us. Um, and then we know so much. So one exercise I thought we could do uh, before we go on is um, sit together for a little bit, explore, have each person explore some of the emotional terrain you've experienced recently, whatever that might be. Choose one really predominant emotion and look inside it, not why is it here and what am I going to do about it and should I switch therapists or whatever, but you know, what is this feeling? First, what is it in my body? And just take note of that. And then see if you can watch the movie of that feeling. Sometimes if I'm working with people over a period of time, I'll say something like, let's say it's anger, I'll say, Next time we meet, see if you can tell me three things you found inside the anger. And one of them can be change. Maybe there's sadness in there. Maybe there's fear in there. Very, very commonly, there is a sense of hopelessness in there. So just a few things. And whatever is in there, it's changing, right? It's coming. It's going. It's actually fluid, however static or concrete, we might take it superficially. So so we'll do a little bit of that together, OK? And, and then um, for those of you who are uh, after the exercise going to be writing, you can just write it down for yourself. Those of you who are here, you can either write or we'll have you just speak to one another um, if you wish, OK? So let's sit together. Uh, and going back to the refuge that is the breath, because it really is a refuge. As my early teachers would say, you don't have to believe anything in order to feel your breath. You don't have to call yourself, you know, a Buddhist or Hindu or reject anything else. If you're breathing, you can be meditating. And as one teacher said, I've always really thought it was charming. He said, the breath is very portable, <laughs> right? So you practice now. We'll practice just for a few minutes. But then you're at work, or you're somewhere where it's very stressful, or you're commuting, and you're getting really anxious, and you're getting really harried. You can breathe, right? Just rest your attention on the breath. So it's right there for you as a way of getting some space. So. Again, you can have your eyes open or closed, however you feel most at ease. See if you can find the place where the breath is clearest for you or strongest for you. Maybe the nostrils, the chest, or the abdomen. Find that place, bring your attention there, and just rest. See if you can feel one breath.
And if you find your attention wandering, don't worry about it. Maybe your mind has jumped to the past or the future, or judgment, speculation, or you've fallen asleep. Really, it's okay. See if you can let go of whatever has distracted you. Let go gently and just bring your attention back to the feeling of the breath. And see if you can bring to mind just an array of emotions you felt in the last week or two. Just what flashes through you as you contemplate that. It could be anything. From anger to boredom, whatever. And then choose one or two, certainly one at a time. And actually enhance it. Strengthen it. See what it feels like in your body. And to do this clearly, you can't be lost and, you know, this is the only thing I'll ever feel forever, or this is wrong to feel. This is an experiment. What does it feel like in your body? Then observe the, the movie of it, the unfolding of it. What do you see within it? Just watch. See what might emerge.
And remember that no matter what you discover, one of the characteristics is going to be change. It's going to be impermanence. It's going to be movement. Yeah, when you feel ready, you can open your eyes. And if you want to take a few moments just to reflect on what you saw, maybe write it down. I don't know if there's anybody here who wants to speak to the person next to them or not. I feel I've learned so much myself in doing that kind of exercise. Like, look at how much loneliness there is in that desire. Look at how much helplessness there is in that anger. So I think we'll, we'll take a few uh, minutes for questions or comments before we go on with the program. I was trying to focus on um, what I watched on television last night and um, trying not to put judgment into that analysis. So I hear anger, and so then I'm like, OK, unpeel it. There's fear. But I'm, then I'm like, there's ignorance, but then it's like, oh wait, I don't want to judge others when I'm trying to understand them. That's why I'm watching this spectacle in the first place, but I can't get past that judgment. You want to start? You want me to start? Uh, why don't you start? Okay. <laughs> and I, I'm looking for tools yeah, to yeah. get past it because yeah, yeah. it's going to be an interesting few months. This affects every relationship because friends and family don't always agree. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, insight. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't make assumptions that everyone in this room agrees, you know, um, or wherever you are. <laughs> um, you know, because that is also true. And uh, I think there's, there's another way of understanding the term judgment, which is maybe not as broad as our usual way, which is, I think, the way you were using it. Because we have views, we have discernment, and there's, there is such a thing as ignorance. You know, um, there is, uh, any of us can have some knowledge of how the universe works, and hopefully a growing knowledge of how the universe works. Um, and if somebody is living in defiance of that, then there's, there's discordance and there's suffering, you know. It's just how it is. Like if you, uh, you know, from the meditative point of view, we would say if you completely refute the idea of change, you refuse to admit that we're all going to die. There's a society maxim right there, right? Stay in control of everything all the time. You can manage that. Um, don't admit any vulnerability because you should be ashamed of... of painful feeling. You shouldn't. Or, and or, um, you don't deserve to feel good. You know, to let in the pleasure, either because there's too much suffering elsewhere or uh, 
you just don't deserve it, you know? I mean, there's a million things like that that are ignorant, that we all have. And, and when they run our lives, then we are suffering. That's why we suffer, is because we're so out of sync. Um, you know, so there are some almost like scientific laws of the universe. Everything changes all of the time. And we are all connected. You know, we live in an interconnected universe. So what happens to some group of people um, over there, it never stays over there. You know, it filters out over here. There is no over there anymore. And, you know, science shows us that. Environmental consciousness shows us that. Even epidemiology shows us that. You know, economics shows us that. That we live in an interconnected universe. So um, if you have a whole worldview that says that's not true, it's kind of scary, you know. But that's different than holding someone in contempt. You know, so when we use the word judgment, it's kind of specific. Um, you know, it's, it's feeling contemptuous or um, it's feeling um, so superior, you know, that uh, we can only assume somebody is coming from a really um, damaged place to have the view that they have. You know, there, there are lots of ways in which we separate very strongly, but um, that's one of the fascinating things about compassion, is like, how can you have compassion for someone and really feel they're wrong? And do everything you can to keep them from being able to uh, effectuate their, to your mind, wrong view. Um, I don't know that I want people who really uh, completely disbelieve in interconnection, running climate policy, you know, or um, anything really, you know. Uh, and so I would work hard to try to keep that from happening. And I don't think that has to come from a place of real, you know, hatred and alienation. And um, it's always, always useful, I think, to look at ourselves, and uh, when we are the most disconnected, what's cooking in there? Uh, and I, I hazard a guess that we would find layers of fear, you know, in ourselves, and I would, I would probably make that assumption about others. And I personally have not been watching anything. But I have a book deadline. <laughs> Can I say something? To you? Please. Uh, I think this goes at the heart of um, one of the gifts of meditation and a reflect is being able to hold the paradox. I think what scares people sometimes about doing healing work is well, I'm going to be removed. I um, mean, is it, is it okay that I can have my safe life and, ca and care for my loved ones when all of this horrible, um, so many horrible situations in the world and the environment? And it's about, can you hold both? Because actually, the thing is that the stronger you are and the more able you are, um, the, the more you can bring to the, the difficult um, things in the world, but what some people can do is try to isolate themselves. And so it requires that strength of being able to um, see both. Like when you saw the judgment, being able to also see the, the fear and to be able to see, oh yeah, I, I could focus on this thought. And that's what a lot of us would do, is focus on this is all the ways that they're wrong. And you take a breath and then you notice, well, there's a sensation of pain. There's also this, um, the, the feeling of my feet on the ground, there's the fact that I'm breathing, there's all of these things happening at the same time. And that is actual health, is being able to see and hold that, all of that complexity. 
Because when you hold out that complexity, instead of being overwhelmed by, wow, this person is so judgmental, you can hold, yes, and we're all human, and we all have this, and we also have this vulnerability, and we also have this incredible urge to help each other. Being able to hold that thought at the same time that you're holding the thought of this particular human being being so difficult to be with, that's, that's being able to hold the paradox. You know? and, um, um, the other tool I would bring is that, you know, um, meta, uh, with nonviolent communication, a lot of times we have this the thing called translating the judgment. A lot of times when there's a, a, a strong judgment, there's this need, this beautiful human need that's not being met. And, and when you get to, to that need, then it changes your, perspe your perspective because then instead of focusing on what's not working, you're focusing on what you want. And that can be liberating. Um, one of the things that I, I has been unearthed in this recent um, series of experiences uh, is, for me, um, an ambivalence around the idea of justice. And um, I think part of it is even a fear of like, a, an equating justice with revenge. I think of sort of an eye for an eye. Like, if you did something wrong, then you should be punished. Um, and I'm just um, looking for some a different perspective. Yeah, I, I think what uh, one of the things I go to is that I don't think, we're, as a society, the media has done a very good job of showing alternatives to punitive systems. Um, but there are lots of people, and there are countries who have taken on practices that are more about restoration of trust and rehabilitation, and they're incredibly successful, and a lot, and most of the time, less expensive than a punitive system. So part of it is research and knowing that those things exist, and really getting the evidence that they work. Because I think I I remember being a high schooler and thinking that. Some people are just bad. <laughs> and I think what's great about doing with, um, practices where you're looking at yourself is that you get to see your quote unquote bad parts and, uh, and be like, huh, this is similar to that bad thing. It's not the same scale, but I can see how this pattern works. And when you can see that and you start seeing shifts, even small shifts, then that has given me a personal trust in the ability of people to change, you know? Because if I, I'm just really touched by your face right now. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think that's what excites me about doing the work that I'm doing is because when I started to see my ability to change in myself and I saw people um, who were doing similar work, you know, now I cry a lot of, out of happiness. And that's, that's the holding the paradox right there, is that at the same time that there's immense pain, there's so many people who are putting their lives at stake to change things. Hmm. It's beautiful. And I think a lot of people, of course, you know, a lot of people do use the word justice to mean revenge. And it's something I've been afraid of for a long time. In, in this country because, you know, I, I could well imagine, like, it's just like too much and someone would seek revenge, but the pattern of escalation, you know, is so clearly laid out in front of us and someone else is gonna, you know, turn on that group, seemingly group, you know, and then, you know, it's just gonna keep growing. And it's something, you know, as soon as, um, the police shooting in Dallas happened. Friends turned to me and said, "You've been talking about this for years," and which I have, you know, and because it scares me so much, just this kind of violent um, escalation, uh, which is what every teacher and um, person of nonviolence has talked about, you know, um, and. And I've also seen it as we have, you know, the word justice used in the most beautiful way, uh, which is really um, 
looking bigger, you know, looking at causes and conditions for uh, actions. Why, you know, why? Like, what makes somebody choose a certain path or have a certain view? Or um, really understanding these things don't just happen. That we're all coming from all these influences and interactions and uh, conditions and socioeconomic conditions and everything. I guess what I mean, so much of um, you know contemplating cause and effect seems so unjust. You know that I could suffer because of you know the circumstances of my birth or benefit. You know that seems profoundly unjust. So it's confusing. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I would say I wouldn't look at justice. Um, I would look at justice not as a sort of rational uh, system, like to answer the question of why, but more that causes and conditions exist. You know, that there's a kind of um, lawfulness to the universe, that things actually, in some level, can make sense. And I think if we are moved to do that work, to try to make it a different world, a better world. We have to look at causes and conditions. Otherwise, we're just staying on the surface. So for example, uh, once in Barry, where I co-founded the Retreat Center, the Insight Meditation Society, um, we had a visiting Thai activist um, who was saying, we were just hanging out in someone's living room, you know, and, and uh, speaking, and he was saying, you know, if you want to deal with sex trafficking, you've got to look at Thai agricultural policy. Why are those farmers starving? You know, like, look deeper. And, and that was unforgettable for me. I mean, we can't always look deepest, you know, but we can look deeper. I think in anything, and then we see ourselves in one another, we see laws and conditions, and we move where our hearts take us to see what we can address. One of the things I do is I teach um, mindfulness to, and emotional and, um, intelligent tools to incarcerated youth. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful experience of the world, because I will see someone and I will hear um, a youth who's been incarcerated, and they will talk about the incredible love they have for their family, and I will see this, the, 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 the tenderness that they have for some of the people they care about and the lengths they have gone to protect and to care. And then sometimes there'll be something about some gang or some situation, and there's just no compassion. There's just like, yeah, they deserve to go, and I have no problem. And it's like, how do you hold that? You know, and I had a friend who got um, accosted and, uh, and robbed in uh, Oakland, and and I, she was in pain, and she knows that I do this work, and she's like, I just don't understand what could lead someone to do that. And again, it was another paradox there, because I was like, I, had, I could tell her yeah. stories. I could tell her yeah. so many stories of young people who are paying rent, you know, or who are homeless and are trying to figure out how to make food, eat. But at the same time, in that moment, was someone with a cast. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is not the time for me to bring in their story. Yeah. She needs to heal before she can have space to hear. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about what we need in this society. I think we're all rocking around with cats in different ways. And we're also all walking around with so much love and then that is so bad, I just don't have space. And I shut down and all the beautiful parts of me aren't available. And how do we work with all of this? And right, and we, and that's what we what we do here. We sit in it, so that we're not just going to the next thing and not processing. We're sitting here and we're being with it. Certainly, in this society, there's a tremendous phobia about looking at pain and suffering. You know, if it's your own, it is cast as something shameful or to be avoided. If it's someone else's, you'd rather 
tuck them away so you don't have to see it. It's so unseemly that you are displaying such suffering. And, and that's, you know, uh, a struggle many of us have with our conditioning. And um, interestingly enough, I find myself these days also talking a lot about the relationship we might have to joy and pleasure and happiness, not just because my books are all called happy something or other, <laughs> you know, which are titles the publisher gives them, not me. Um, <coughs> um, but it's intriguing to me. I've spent so much of my life trying to come to terms with suffering and in a hugely important way, you know, what's the role of compassion rather than all that separation and so on. And it's just been lately, I've also been kind of playing a lot in the fields of joy and happiness. And part of it is also part of that healing in this time because it feels so wrong somehow to just take a moment and enjoy something. But in the end, we're talking about balance. We're talking about resilience. We're talking about having some sense of inner resource so we don't feel so utterly depleted. Because if we do feel utterly depleted, and overwhelmed and shattered, we don't have the wherewithal to actually try to make a difference or even keep tuning in. It's like too much. Uh, I was talking to Bill before a little bit about Russia, and I always think about this time I went to the Soviet Union, it was still the Soviet Union in those days, a uh, long time ago in the 80s. And, um, I went with my friend, my colleague Joseph Goldstein, to teach, and it was actually illegal to teach meditation in those days, so we went as part of a tour group, and we even brought Joseph's mother as kind of cover, you know, so no one would know what we were doing, and every afternoon we would like disappear, he and I, and we'd go off with a, a translator into someone's living room, and we would teach, and I found myself speaking a lot about compassion, in those days, and every time I did, I kind of got this really, like there was this really funny feeling in the room, so I finally sat down with the translator and I said, when I say compassion, what do you say? Yeah. And they said, oh, you know, it's like the state, you're like miserable and you feel horrible and oh. you know, <laughs> you're broken by the suffering that you see. And they said, it's like someone has taken a giant stake and driven it through your heart. <laughs> And I thought, no wonder there's a really funny feeling in the room, you know? And it's like, oh, but we can actually be pretty close to that, right? And it's not selfish, it's not self-centered, it's not like weird to feel, I need a different kind of balance, you know? I need something that is more uplifting, that will um, give me that kind of resilience and help me. Uh, so that's very, very important. And I, I did a program, um, it was a four-year program working with uh, frontline domestic violence shelter workers. Um, and we asked in the beginning, like, uh, it was actually interesting, it was in the context of work. So we said, what's your greatest stressor at work? And this was all written, so you didn't have to disclose anything if you didn't want. And that was interesting, because people who did choose to speak would sometimes say surprising things, like colleagues, you know, not sort of the uh, hideous workload or something. It was, but it was interesting to look at. And then the second column was, what do you do? to kind of lift your spirits or get a break or get some perspective on things. And they'd write them down. And then uh, the third column was, how do you feel about the things you wrote down in the second column? You know, so every single person, as far as I know, through four years in that second column wrote down music. It was all different kinds of music, but everybody wrote down listening to music. Uh, for some people, they were they were quite religious. Other people, it was nature, and this is like New York City. You know, it's very like gritty, um, and you know, so, sometimes people looked at that second column. They said, "That's what really helps me. I'm not doing any of that. That's not good." Or maybe they wrote down, "I drink a lot," and they say, "I'm doing a little too much of that." You know, maybe I need to stop that. Um, 
And one woman who, who did read her thing, she said, I watch a lot of American Idol, which I laughed, you know, and I said, oh, I saw that once. I got unbelievably stressed out. For me, it was like watching continual rejection. Yeah. You know, there's not a way in the world that for me, yeah. it would have helped. Um, and then we just said, okay, here are these tools. If you want to experiment with them, here's meditation, here's yoga, you know, here are these other things you might try. Because in the end, you cannot go on in a good way without both a sense of relief and some experience of joy, which could be very immediate, you know, somebody's smile or a friend or, you know, something that will really help us. And I think that's why what we're doing here is so important. Um, we, we talked about, when we were thinking about today, it's like, well, don't, when do we want to have a dialogue? When do we want to, and it's so important that that be set up. And it also is important that it's at a time, because what I was saying about walking around with cats, like with, the, with what's happening in the news, I think it's like getting hit, you know? It's being really emotionally hit. And so we really need to take care of ourselves. And it's not being selfish, it's, it's getting prepared. It's like clearing the space so that we can have those dialogues and we can take those actions. Because I think all of us want to create a better world. And um, I think, so, it, uh, so these, and, and, and there's just different ways of how to, how to get ourselves healed, how to heal the emotional cast that we're in. And these are one of the, uh, of the tools. And some of it is being able to take a break and see the beauty in the world. Like, it's, it's good for me to remember, no matter how many, what the headlines are, there are hummingbirds. <laughs> There are water, there's like waves, there's the sun. I mean, we're on a huge rock <laughs> orbiting a fireball. <laughs> like, let's make this more fun. Uh, <laughs> okay, so this is its own uh, distinct method of meditation um, where rather than resting our attention in the feeling of the breath, the sensations of the breath, we rest our attention in the silent repetition of certain phrases. So the phrases are ways of paying attention differently. So for example, if you are in the habit of kind of looking at yourself at the end of the day, almost as though to evaluate yourself, like how did I do today? And let's say you have the habit of pretty well only remembering the mistakes you made and the things you could have done better and what you didn't really like, let's just say. <laughs> you know, So much so that your whole sense of who you are and all that you will ever be just collapses around that really stupid thing you said at lunch in a meeting. So the practice of loving kindness is one of gift giving. It's offering like wishing well. So instead of fixating on all those mistakes, we kind of expand our sense of who we are. Like, anything good happened today? <laughs> Any good within me? Um, and it's not meant to be like deluded or wishful thinking, like you're not insisting, oh, wasn't that a brilliant and witty thing I said at lunch? Maybe it was really stupid, and there are consequences to that. But that's not all that we are, so it's that collapse, right? So what do we look at? Do we pretty well only look at what's wrong? And who do we look at? Who do we look through? Who doesn't count? Who is the other, not even just by dint of prejudice or bias, but just indifference? So what happens when we look at them rather than through them? So all of this is done through the silent repetition of certain phrases. Phrases are very simple, like, may I be happy, may you be happy. Um, being words, they are quite imperfect, I know that. Um, but it's a vehicle for us to pay attention differently and to include where maybe we've previously excluded or to loosen the grip of some of those fixations on what's wrong and so on. So we make that offering to ourselves, to all kinds of uh, different beings in our sphere, you know, those we like, those we don't like that much, 
Um, and we end with all beings everywhere. So there are a million variations of this, and I'll guide you through one, okay? So see if you could sit comfortably. Again, you can close your eyes or not. Let your energy just settle in your body. See if there are three or four phrases that make sense to you as this kind of offering. Common phrases are things like, <coughs> beginning with yourself, may I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. Live with ease means in the things of day-to-day -day life, like livelihood, family, may not be such a struggle. May I live with ease. May I be safe. Be happy. Be healthy. Live with ease. You can use these phrases or any phrases that come to mind. Just three or four, very general. And repeat them over and over again with enough space and enough silence so that it's a rhythm that's pleasing to you. I have a friend who thought he'd get extra credit by saying more phrases, he said, really fast. you don't need to do that. See if you can gather all your attention behind one phrase at a time, and then the next. And the skill set is really very much the same. If your attention wanders, doesn't matter. See if you can gently let go and just come back. And then if there's a benefactor, someone who's helped you, maybe mentored you or inspired you from afar, bring them here. Maybe say their name to yourself or get an image of them. Get a feeling for their presence and offer these phrases to them. Even again, if the phrases aren't perfect, they're like a vehicle for us. They're serving us.
and then a friend, the first friend who comes to mind. Someone you find slightly annoying, not really bad, just a little bit. To see what happens. And all beings everywhere, all people, all creatures, all those in existence, may all beings be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. And you. So thanks. To Phoenix and Sharon for coming on very short notice. Uh, everything that we put together has really been sort of uh, responding to the needs of the community. Um, and in particular, thank you to Ruchika, who did all this planning. Uh, for any of you who have put together a tech talk or something similar, getting a tech talk room on two days notice and putting everything together is a, is a huge feat. So thank you. Um, in terms of follow-on resources, um, there's uh, GPAUSE. 
and GPAWS is holding, uh, in particular, this sort of compassion meditation uh, every day at noon Pacific time. If you go to go slash GPAWS, uh, you'll find the, the GVC, so you don't have to be in any particular place. Um, and then there's all the other GPAWS programs. In addition, um, there's also the EAP, the Employee Assistance Program, as well as um, GCALM, C-A-L-M, which is um, uh, a mindfulness-based stress reduction system that uh, online platform that's doing quite well. So with that also, thank you for showing up for yourselves. This is really challenging work, and I think everybody who shows up to do this work is in a great position to, uh, uh, to be a leader. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.